just to make sure they're visible in the video before sharing the presentation. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the ACT lecture series. Uh, we're very happy to be joined today by uh, Professor <laughs> John Now. He's a research and architect, and he's already been a visiting professor at Polinos. So we're really happy to have you back here, especially in this context. And as you all know, the theme of the lecture of the year is. Um, reasons to hate and love architecture, and this is why we thought uh, uh, the lecture that the professor has prepared for us especially takes the topic. Um, he will talk us on how um, architects, in a way, are constrained by laws and um, coding systems, and how they can overcome that, uh, even coming up with new building types and um, architectural practices. And I think I can read the words of Professor Vital and I'm to show you Sure. Thank you. See, yeah. Can you hear me? No? Is that okay? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's very exciting to be back in Torino and also meeting some former students from Hong Kong. <laughs> and, and thanks for the, in, for, the, for, the, for the invitation to give a lecture here. Um, uh, I was, uh, I understood when I got the invitation, I, I, I was notified about this kind of anti-thesis to love to love architecture, which has to do with hate architecture, hate architecture that the series kind of frames itself around. And, uh, and um, there, there, there was a discussion about some kind of, and, and what kind of complications that, that, that creates for the discipline and for the pro profession. And I was asked, and now, and now I'm quoting here from the introduction to, uh, I was asked to shed light on the issues related to the discipline in a disillusioned yet proactive way through research and design experiences and to underline how, uh, despite the complications, uh, making architecture offers innovative uh, visions and tangible design opportunities. And uh, this was pretty interesting for me because I think uh, uh, a, a large part of my of my research and design practice has been kind of, uh, kind of operating in that, in that in that uh, di direction, and I went back to look at uh, projects that I've been working with for quite quite a long time before this 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 lecture today. Uh, the complications uh, that I have been interested in is the systems that architects uh, need to engage with in order to produce solutions for the construction of society. Uh, I mean, for me, architecture has always been a process of resistance uh, towards the status quo of governance and industry. And by that, I mean, I think, I mean, to me, architecture, both as a discipline and, and a practice, is a creative force and uh, a tool to, uh, to evaluate uh, and, and upgrade the concepts that materialize society. So, and to do so, I think that design uh, and architecture needs to challenge or disobey. Uh, the system that normalize our ideas about what a building or a city is or should be. Sure. Absolutely. Now I'm going to try to understand how I can shift images here. How do I shift images? The arrows doesn't work. Oh, that's better. So, do you, do you hear me now? It's better? Yeah. Okay, great. So, one such system, there are many systems, uh, but one such system that I have experienced very early in my career um, is the jurisdictional system that city governments communicate through zoning plans. And here I have an image of uh, the first comprehensive zoning plan, or actually a fragment of it, 
of the, the first comprehensive zoning plan in the world, which is the zoning plan of New, of, uh, New York City that was adopted in 1916. And uh, this quote by Levy is uh, who actually lived in New York for most of his life. It's quite telling to me. When Levy says that any city's growth and decay is governed by legal instruments, building codes and zoning ordinances, which guide and constrain the ideas and ambitions of individuals and smooth out all about the most jarring cultural changes. And in this quote, I think we find, or to me at least, I find this complication that, that, that this lecture series kind of is looking for, uh, which is uh, the intersection of the codes and regulations that we have in, in, in the city that are needed, uh, but how they can operate and how they intersect with the architects ambition to produce innovations and new, and new solutions. And this intersection uh, I've experienced many times doesn't really work. I mean, sometimes it's very, very problematic. And these problems I've been interested in uh, to kind of operate and to look at uh, through my research and my practice. And so I would, I mean, I would go back to, I mean, why, why is this? I mean, I would argue that ever since uh, Ilde von Sada made urbanism into an autonomous discipline, uh, the socioeconomic systems of production and consumption, uh, they, and they channel, channel this universal premises of modern legislation. And they have grown into the prime apparatus of exercising power. And to this power architecture, an urban organization must relate. And as these systems are, Sovereign, uh, they have marginalized or repressed specific aspects of life and space. And they have done so basically because they have often have a, a limited capacity to adapt to uh, local significance and site specific characteristics. So, um, what I mean with this is basically that the universal planning legislation uh, that operates in most, uh, most areas around the world, I think, uh, basically have a very difficulties in managing processes or processing minor deviations that occurs on the site. It could be to topological kind of variations or emergent lifestyles, informal economies. These things are very difficult to, to, to uh, process through uh, modern kind of legislation. And we see here, one result of this universal planning legislation, which is a sub, sub, suburban typology. Uh, uh, and in this context, I mean, here we have le legislation kind of straitjackets the relationship between architecture, land use, mobility, and kind of socio cultural di dynamics, and makes it very, very difficult to up upgrade this, uh, this typology. And I will talk much more. More about this. But the interesting thing is that this legislation looks pretty much all over the world. I mean, it looks the same in Sweden, in the United States, in Australia, in many other European countries. It's, a, it's called the Single Family Residential Zoning. And um, it was drafted in the late 90s, early 20th centuries. It was implemented through uh, legislations in the kind of 1910s, 1920s in the United States and became a police power in the 1920s. And it was exported to the world with the post World War II economic boom, and it still remains intact in many ways. Um, and um, uh, this is one legislation I've been interested in looking at how it interacts with architecture, and uh, how it makes architect how it makes it very difficult to up upgrade uh, this kind of a uh, kind of suburban form, basically. So I began my career uh, uh, in practice. I was working in practice and uh, working with, with designing and, and kind of buildings and, and um, working with very high ambition all the time, trying to uh, investigate new, new ways of solution to, to, to sites and to lifestyles. And I discovered very early how, how these um, ambitions were constrained by, by, by regulation and how it would have been much more easy as an architect to implement something that is um, conventional. 
And then I moved into research, and uh, during that I discovered, uh, I moved to Los Angeles, I did my PhD in, in, in LA, and in, in Los Angeles I discovered that beyond these codes and regulations, uh, that, that, that there were actually lifestyles uh, with uh, social contracts and behaviors that operated beyond the codes. Um, they basically uh, created uh, economic systems and, 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 and spatial systems that were illegal, and that, but that suited their, their, uh, their needs and their, and their demands on uh, architecture and space. So these lifestyles and social contracts, they, they kind of disobeyed uh, codes and regulations. And what made it really interesting as a researcher was to see how you can use, take these, these, uh, these behaviors and pull them into the discipline of architecture and upgrade our disciplinary knowledge and experiences through these illegal practices. And so for this lecture, I have called this process uh, uh, or this discovery an architecture of disobedience. And why, why this word? And to me, disobedience, I mean, it's kind of close to resistance, but I would argue that resistance is more vocal and it's also very strategic, a resistance. You have a strategy for something, right? If you disobey something, you operate more sly, more tactic. Uh, it's a little bit, I remember I discussed this with Neil, Neil Denari when I, when I worked on my, on my dissertation, and we discussed this way of working with practice uh, and, the, and kind of disobeying uh, um, codes and regulation. He said it's, it's, like, it's like cutting someone with a razor blade they still, they don't know they are bleeding yet. And that is basically this kind of slyness or this kind of, uh, this kind of tactical way of operating uh, that I think is, is a little bit little different from being, from resisting something. So I will now use my, my some practice-based, two practice-based research projects to, to, um, to describe a little more, uh, to give you a much more examples of what I, what I mean with this, uh, moving from research into practice in terms of uh, disobeying uh, codes and regulations. And I will start in Los Angeles. So uh, here we have LA. Fantastic place, uh, a carpet of a, of a low rise, low density kind of uh, ur urbanism, basically. And uh, when you study the urban planning of Los Angeles, so here we have the city of Los Angeles. You see, LA is really big city, it goes into the San, all the uh, Santa Ana Mountains here. Uh, and, I've been working with the city of Los Angeles, which is kind of this kind of weird form that out, outlines this kind of jurisdictional kind of area. And if you look at the, uh, the land use plans of the city of LA, it looks like this. And uh, the yellow color, it's used, I think, in many uh, countries. The yellow color uh, means uh, um, single family residential zoning. So you see that a huge part of the city of Los Angeles uh, uh, is, is zoned uh, through single family residential zoning. And that le legislation basically allows you only to build one main building and one supplementary building on the plot. And this supplementary building is often a garage. That's a bit faster. That's only thing, the only thing you can build on, on, uh, on, uh, on these properties. And you see that there is a lot of, I mean, only the city of, 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 of a name and I did this research that was almost half a million lots only sold for single family residential use only. And I find, but when you start to look at, uh, at what's actually being built, when you zoom into these single family residential zones in Los Angeles, uh, you see that there is a lot of stuff that doesn't really comply with the zoning plan, right? Here we have, a situation. This is in Pacoima in uh, San Fernando Valley, an area that I've been working with researching quite a lot. Here is one property that is that complies with the, with the regulations correctly. Right? It's um, one main building and a garage. 
But you see that here, the, when you look at it from above, you have, you know, the main building is over here, but you have several kind of supplementary buildings being, being built in the backyards. They are hidden from the streets, from the streets where zoning inspectors normally uh, inspect areas. We we'll drive along the street and we say, okay, this looks good. This is these obey the codes. No, no. Look in the backyard, there's something else happening. And um, I found this very in interesting when I when I discovered this in uh, in uh, Los Angeles, because it uh, it uh, challenged the conventions in the suburban lifestyles and the building typologies in sub in sub sub suburbia, and uh, also being of course illegal, it opened up some kind of a, a realm of fascination and excitement. So I started in my research to discover the emergence of a new building type uh, in California and also in Southern Canada, in areas where there were a lot of single family residential zones. It's called the Accessory Dwelling Unit or a ADU. And uh, this is a building type that appeared in, 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 in these areas uh, of a single family residential zoning. Uh, it was built informally. They had tried, when I was in LA, they had tried for 20 or 30 years to legalize these kinds of, 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 uh, of architecture, but it wasn't, it wasn't possible to get it legalized. Uh, so it was, but it was still being built informally and under, under the, the uh, radar of the codes. And uh, why? So, and, and the important thing that, that the ADU is an autonomous living unit. It should have its own entrance, its own bathrooms, its own, its own bedroom, its own kitchen area. It should be a, a living unit that is completely autonomous, actually uh, either detached or attached to the, single, to the main, main, main building of a, on a, on a, on a sub suburban lot. Uh, so why is this interesting uh, in Los Angeles? And, Above all, I mean, why is it interesting? Well, in LA, we could see that um, the ADU was making use of un un underutilized land. So the backyards of, of, of suburban properties were kind of becoming densified with new, new buildings, which, which, which pro provided alternative spaces, you know, uh, kind of affordable housing possibilities uh, or housing for, for, um, for, um, Refugees, or you know, these kinds of 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 of, of, of architecture, and it's also very interesting because it kind of densifies sub suburbia, which makes it possible to introduce more efficient uh, public transportation and other kind of economies start to emerge in in suburbia. Uh, so I found it very interesting with these these um, these ADUs being. Uh, um, being built. And um, here we see, I mean, LA is a city where it has a scarcity of land. Uh, the city has expanded so much, it can reach its outer, outer uh, areas, and uh, it can't expand any, any, anymore. Still, there is an influx of people, so the, so the, so the, so the population is, ex is escalating. Thus, they need to find other solutions of, of how to create city. And here you have great areas of, of, of Great lands possible to be developed and to hold, to, to house house people in these backyards, and you could start to think about uh, an alternative way to master planning, where we could think about an inc inc incremental growth of the of the city instead of a, instead of a master plan. How you could have a much more entrepreneurial driven kind of urbanism being created through the architecture of the of the ADU. So these things I've been very interested in and looking at through my research. Um, I've also, of course, uh, looked at the architecture of, um, of, of the accessory dwelling unit, uh, which offers um, uh, possibilities to really scrutinize. I mean, what architecture can, can do in terms of site specificity. I mean, he would have a, su a suburb of plots. I mean, the architecture can operate much more fluidly with the uh, vegetation, with top topography, with different kinds of variations, uh, impact of sound and light and these things. So uh, uh, I've been interested in looking at how the, how the property typology kind of match with the, with the ADU. 
And uh, of course, I mean, the, archi the architecture of the ADU, the tectonics, the organizational space in, 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 such, such, in such a building type. So as a scholar, of course, I started to publish a lot about accessory dwelling units. Um, that's what you do. Uh, and uh, you develop knowledge through different kinds of publications. But I also thought I would show you this, uh, this part of the research, which is, um, which is, um, now you don't hear too much and that's pretty good, but there is a sound here uh, attached to the, to the, um, I just want to uh, show you this as an alternative uh, research method. Um, I was interested in kind of researching and mapping uh, how the front yard and the backyard lived in the background of the suburban landscape. And the difference between uh, the uh, uh, psychologists. And uh, this is a form of research that I did together with an urban planner and the media artist. And, uh, Heavily influenced in Ed Boucher's 1966 art work, other than the Atlantic Square, which is a non map in the Atlantic Square. So here I map, and I was the term is the traveling between the world. If you go to the backyard, it's so easy to discover. It looks like when you have more than four of the things happening, it looks like you have the kind of real exposure to the atmosphere. Informally, which composed the development of the And then uh, this has been exhibited in several places in Istanbul and other places. So it's meant to be as a lead of art research type of project. So Patrick can talk about the young and the priest this year tomorrow, and we'll uh, talk about the method. And so, as an architect and uh, and a researcher, I'm very my research is often very practice based. I'm interested in in testing my my my, my results through construction, through design and construction. And then um, I took my research into practice. My research on the A ADU into practice uh, when I was contacted by a client uh, in, in South Sweden, in, in South and Helsingborg, uh, who needed an addition to his, uh, to his single family residence in a small fisherman's village. Um, and um, so here was the site for this project, small kind of uh, sub suburban house, basically with a little garage. And, uh, they were they had they were, they had two adults and three kids in there, so they need more more more, more space for the kids. And I was working on my ADU research and I thought, oh wow, this is a great opportunity here to to perhaps be able to build and design a building maybe test how they work through the through the jurisdictional system. They didn't ask for ADU, they didn't know what it was. But when I explained the, the opportunities to create an architecture that you can, you know, sublet, uh, be much more flexible, they said, "Okay, let's let's work with an accessory dwelling unit." Uh, so we started to uh, to uh, do that, and of course, it was problems with zoning, uh, many different problems. So we're not we're not allowed to do this. So we discussed with the municipality. Uh, and one interesting part of zoning here was the heritage code. This is a fisherman's village in South Sweden. It's covered by, her by uh, it's protected by a heritage code that uh, requires all new construction to obey to uh, to some kind of tectonics uh, from that is uh, that the tectonics of the kind of fisherman's house. No, so I didn't bring uh, bring a plan of of this of this suburban village here, but but most of the of the buildings are kind of former fishermen's uh, houses that have been turned into residences. And they basically have a, a tectonics and an aesthetic like like, uh, like this, so it's going to have a bit of heritage from the, from from the fishermen's village. But there is a small number of prominent neoclassical neo architectures in this village. 
And uh, the city has drafted a code that overlaid all architecture, which basically required both uh, uh, additions to, uh, to, uh, to, to the macro buildings like this and uh, additions to neoclassical buildings like this to be the same. And I said, this is wrong. I mean, this is wrong from an, from an urban perspective, from a heritage perspective, from an architecture perspective, because you destroy uh, the neoclassical uh, uh, population of buildings by adding, by adding an architecture that doesn't work, that is not contextualized in that disciplinary uh, background as a neoclassical building is. I mean, the architecture of the, of the vernacular here, you see tar paper gables. Uh, that goes together with the tarp of the room can be explained through folks at the Hildebrand's um, uh, scholarship uh, why the, why the neoclassical architecture it could be described with really clear distinctions between roof, uh, walls, uh, and foundation to Semper's scholarship. So they are very, very different. Um, and I think this is quite interesting to bring up because I use this right into the city planning office. And it demonstrates how architecture theory can be utilized, not only in writing papers and hearing classes, but it can actually bring knowledge in architecture history and theory right into the processes of urban planning and, and construction in the, in the city planning offices to make arguments about what you want to do. And we succeeded. Um, it, uh, we worked with, it took a long time to change the zoning plan here. I think it took five or six years. Uh, and then we had to work with a building permit. And I always work with combinations of models, uh, both physical and digital models as my main tool as a designer. Um, and you see here, uh, we agreed with the city. Uh, this was an ADU, but there was kind of a chunk of land here on the corner of the side. And this is a house and here's a garage. And the only possible location was so we couldn't build it on the back in the backyard. So this would be very visible uh, uh, for, as you know, as piece of architecture uh, when it was constructed. But then, um, but then uh, it, of course, I mean, the location of the building and uh, this heterogeneous kind of uh, um, situation on the on the in in the village, the heterogeneous kind of uh, aesthetics of the of the village. Uh, helped us to shape the concept for the for the architectural design of this ADU. Um, we agreed to work with a strong building form in topology, which distinguishes itself from the main building. Um, but we also agreed to work with tar paper, which is a which which is a material that is being brought in from the vernacular tra tradition of, of the fishermen's uh, buildings. Um, and to work with this kind of gable roof in lexicality and to bring to continue with this, this kind of shape, make some kind of a reference to the to the to, to the buildings on, on, on site there. Uh, and then a very important aspect of this of this project was to work very much with the movement here around the corner. We wanted to create a building form that while we use it, the topological geometry to break down the form. So it comes it, it, so it experiences a very kind of fragmented small form, small a very detailed form, and it changes when you move along the corner. That was a very important um, part of the concept of, that we studied quite quite, quite a lot with models and, 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 and drawings. Um, so um, uh, here you see how uh, the actual uh, the development of the of, of the architecture. We work with a slab, a wall system, and a skin. Um, and you see also, I think, the outer form in topology, uh, which is an interesting geometry to work with as an architect, because uh, the contractor must follow the drawings. Uh, if they if they don't follow the drawings and the measures, they screw up with a with you know for example with the height of, of this kind of hole uh, um, here, the entire geometry collapses and it becomes you know really difficult for them to 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 build the building. So it gives the architect the power. Uh,
through the entire architectural concept in the geometry, geometry facilitated this this project. So here is the plan drawing. Uh, uh, you know, of course, you just can't read it up here, but you have this is an autonomous living unit with an entrance here. Uh, it's connected to the to the main building through a former door that it, 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 it's quite a big entrance area and uh, it's designed you would be able to put the door here if you want to uh, and close this off so it's completely and then put the door back here and then we put basically give you an entrance space with two completely autonomous kind of living units. You have a quite big uh, kind of storage area here, number six. You have a kitchen here, number two. Uh, bathroom uh, with shower and stuff, and then a place for um, having a meal and uh, work and so. And then you have it's quite a conventional living program, but it, it, it kind of works very well. And it's very small, it's 40 square meters. So it, 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 it's a small, small piece of architecture. And here's the final rendering that we showed for the clients when they ag agreed. Um, and then here is the, the, the result of the, of the project. You see it is, uh, oh, it's very, very dark here. Sorry about that. Very dark here also. <laughs> what you can not see, but what you could have seen is the uh, better quality on the, on the projector would be this surface of the topology here. It may sense the tar paper texture here on this on, on the facade. The entire piece is covered with tar paper. And when you move around the corners here, um, of course, what you really can't see is that you shift in, in details, but um, they are there. And on the on the other side, facing the facing the private yard, you have quite a few openings that opens up for to to the courtyard that is used. Uh, a lot by the family, so it's it kind of organizes also the spaces that were there uh, when we started to work with the, with the project next to the to the garage here. It's, it's, a, it's a nice setting, and some interior shots um, of how it how it looks on the inside. Uh, with areas of kitchens back here, back this wall, former entrance here into the main building. And uh, uh, the main kind of uh, bedroom area with concrete foundation details and uh, a nice space. So that's the accessory dwelling unit. Now we're going to move to another uh, building type that also has been uh, emerging through disobedience and illegality. So we moved from Los Angeles to Sweden, now we're moving to New York City. And uh, this has to do with loft architecture, loft living. Uh, an area that I've been researching also quite a lot. Um, and the modern uh, live-work loft, uh, it emerged in Lower Manhattan after the World War II. Um, and, and then it boomed in the 1950s when when artists started to move into uh, aban to abandon the uh, um, industrial buildings that they have uh, acquired for uh, for working purposes, and and uh, so artists basically uh, rented uh, uh, industrial spaces and they started to work in those spaces and then they started to live in those spaces that was not legal in the zoning plan, which required uh, the industrial spaces to be used for pro for, pro for production only, uh, and uh, and uh, this this process was contextualized in the in the restructuring process that that, that the United States experienced after the World War II, when uh, the in, the industrial pro production amped up its scale, so. Low Manhattan was filled up with uh, with manufacturing spaces in in industrial buildings uh, that was built in the late 19th and throughout the 20th century, 
but then with, with the World War II, I mean, and, and, and in the post-World War II period, the industries started to work in a different way. So they moved out to the hinterlands and uh, in New York City and Lower Manhattan experienced a huge uh, number of abandon in industrial buildings. And then uh, these buildings were perfect for art production. And uh, 